let's see. It's been all of about, well, I don't know, five minutes since I made a video talking about audio equipment, so I guess the time has come to do it again. This is my main basement stereo system. This is also one of my favorite stereo systems because it sounds so good, and I'm not the only person who's felt that way. I have a pair of Sony speakers at the front of the room and a pair of acoustic research speakers at the back of the room. And just as kind of a quick recap, the whole thing is driven by a Pioneer SX253R stereo receiver that I really could not ask any more of because I gave all of about, oh, I think 50 cents for this thing at a ham fest. Was told it didn't work, and that's probably getting closer to being a decade ago. And when my uh, good old Optimus uh, STA795 receiver shot craps, I hauled out some cheap little receivers, and then I finally remembered this one, which I had parked on a shelving unit outside, and it was being exposed to the brunt of winter weather. But I cleaned it up, brought it in, and it's worked beautifully ever since. Replacing it would be kind of a bear, because the one thing I really like about it is the fact that it has all these different inputs on it. There's two tape inputs, turntable, tuner, laser disc, and CD. And of course, I have two CD players hooked up. Uh, one of them's hooked up to the laser disc input, and the other one is, of course, hooked up to the CD input. And that works really well. Well, the one thing that I've had in this system from time to time, and, and this has been the piece that's had the most turnover by far and away, and that's been cassette decks. I've had a lot of different cassette decks in here. I started out with a Fisher cassette deck that worked very well. It, it was kind of a black plastic crap kind of a piece because it had the piano key transport and all that stuff. But I'd say it uh, dated from about 1985, and it worked pretty well. Until one day, its little motor or something in the motor's power circuit developed a short, and it started, uh, started to burn, which was not really very good. So then it was replaced with a uh, with a garage sale. This is a CTW208R from Pioneer that it was replaced with, and that that lasted perfectly until I decided I wanted a cassette deck on my computer to pull stuff in via cassette tape and digitize it to uh, CD and WAV file. So then I found this uh, Kenwood Full Logic Dual Well deck that worked quite well. But its logic was apparently subject to uh, fits of fancy from time to time, and it would start doing such clever things as turning both reels in the uh, downward position, not the take-up position, the opposite of that, the supply position, I guess you could say, which would lead to a tape-eating incident, and so eventually I junked that deck and I just did without. But now I've done two things over the past uh, week or so. First of all, I've gone ahead, and this is my computer room, and my computer room is a horrible mess, so I'm not going to show... Uh, all of it to you, but I've gone ahead and I've cleaned up the stereo shelf, and I've also re-added tape decks to my system. This is one of the reasons why I love the SX253R receiver, because it's got all these inputs, and although I'm at my limit, well, I say that, the tape 1 input is still unused. I used to have a computer hooked up to that, but it died of bloated caps, and I just didn't feel like I could be bothered to fix it. I didn't need a digital media player down here that badly. But I have cassette decks in my system again. I have the Sony RX77ES down here after its uh, speed calibration adventure. And then over here, I have a realistic tape control center. This is, um, this is basically a way to hook up three tape decks to your system and switch amongst them. You can also arrange for different dubbing arrangements, stuff like that. Two of the inputs are used on that because I have one of them hooked up to the Technics RSM-218, and I also have that Sony Mini Disc player down here. And I'm trying to keep all this stuff relatively easy to operate, so you don't need like an electrical engineering degree or anything to run it, but the switching arrangement's definitely a little bit interesting. I start up here, I'll just give you a quick demonstration, by turning on the tape loop. That's another thing I would be lost without in this particular system, and unfortunately a lot of modern stereo receivers don't have a proper tape monitor loop anymore. Anyway, to get to the Sony deck, I go ahead and I hit tape monitor 1 on the Optimus equalizer, and then I can start the tape playing. Anyway, you get the idea with that. The Sony's a nice deck and all, but I'd have really expected more out of something sold as a premium deck. 
I have noticed that when I'm listening with headphones on, I can just detect a little bit of wandering in the speed on the Sony. It's just not totally dead stable. And when it's been on for a while, I've also noticed that it's making a bad bearing noise. I suspect that the uh, cassette motor has a minorly bad bearing because it starts slightly squealing from inside. And so I think I may try to hit that with some penetrating oil, but it'll be difficult not to get that on belts and things that absolutely should not be lubricated. Doesn't seem to make any difference to the speed of the machine. I haven't noticed any instability caused by a dragging bearing, but it's annoying to listen to, and so I don't leave this deck on a whole lot. And then over here, I would have to say that this Technics RSM218 is a much better deck than the Sony. I know, I'm biased, I can't help but be biased, but its speed is a lot more stable, which when you consider that it dates from, oh, 1981, 82, somewhere in there, so it's basically 30 years old, still running in the original belts, and the only thing I had to do was adjust the speed on it, and it's been rock solid ever since. Leads me to believe somebody was inside with it goofing around. I really don't think that sudden of a speed shift could have occurred all by itself without some external influence or a motor failure, but there's no evidence of a motor failure. But it's still dead quiet, and the speed is very good after all these years. Shows no sign of needing belts or anything like that. Then on the bottom, I have the mini disc player, and that's what the uh, tape control center is used for. I have the Technics deck set up to uh, the deck one position, and I have the mini disc deck set to the two monitor position. So I can do dubbing between those, and I can also dub between the Sony and the Technics by way of the equalizer, which actually has a set of tape dubbing buttons on it to go from one to two, or two to one. And of course it has all the other equalizer related toys, like, well, the equalizer itself, the spectrum display, and the uh, stereo image enhancer, which is kind of gimmicky, but not too bad. So that's pretty much the uh, new stereo setup I've got going on down here. Now, just a little demonstration of the Technics deck. I go ahead and I put it over on the second tape monitor, make sure the source is set to one down here on the tape switch, and then I go over here and I just hit play. You'll notice that tape seems to have a rather hot signal on it. It really doesn't, but apparently there's some variation in calibration on the level meters of tape decks because all my Technics decks seem to be calibrated fairly conservatively, whereas all my other decks are much more liberal. And what shows up as a high recording level on the Technics doesn't show up as very high on the others. So I'm not sure why there's a difference there, but there is. And then to listen to the mini disc player, I just change the source down here to two, just like that. And I actually got a remote for this thing. I decided if the display was going to work and it was going to be agreeable, I guess I could be bothered to put the money into a proper remote for it. So went to eBay, found a remote. I think it cost me seven bucks plus another outrageous amount of shipping and gouging. It was really ridiculous, but it was still the cheapest remote I could find. And so I can just go ahead and queue it up via the remote here. And despite what some people have said about the audio compression on this unit, I have thrown a lot of music at this thing, live from the radio, from CDs, other cassettes, and I don't know if it's just the fact that this is a little higher end model than the one uh, YouTube user V Westlife has been playing with, and I did hear compression artifacting in his. I haven't been able to make Sony's A-Track compression system fail. Maybe I'm just not throwing the right kind of materials at it, maybe I'm just not hearing it but I certainly heard it in his video demonstration of a mini disc player, so my guess is that it's there. Rather interestingly, the remote allows you to actually eject the mini disc from the unit. You notice it's, uh, it's a little fidgety there when it ejects the disc. It kind of vacillates between saying welcome and no disc. I think this thing is probably going to need some attention in the future for uh, dirty micro switches, which seem to be a problem that plagues the uh, MDS JE510. Anyway, that's about it. That's all I can think of to say. This is just my new uh, my new cassette-based stereo setup. 
There's really only one more thing to talk about. I'd mentioned these Fujifilm DR2. I guess I could at least be bothered to hold this upright. Look at that evil cable mess back there. But these Sony, these, Sony, these Fuji DR2 high bias uh, chrome tapes, I have got to say, I've been playing with these. I unwrapped a few of them from the box, and I've got to say, these are great tapes. They have a very low level of noise. On the one that I recorded so far, I've, well, I've played with more than one of them, but on of all that I've played with so far, only one of them has had any sign of audible dropouts, and it was toward the beginning of the tape, and it was just very, very minor. If I hadn't have been listening through headphones, I probably would have missed it. So these are very good tapes. Very low noise, nice, smooth bass response, good response from the mids and trebles, and that's recording without any kind of a noise reduction process going on. So these definitely get the UXW Bill stamp of approval, which is worth about what you paid for it, so hopefully not much. I also, by way of audio karma, as if I needed more things to spend money on, also became aware that it's possible to buy new old stock Radio Shack super high definition cassette tapes. These are SHD 110s. I believe these are 55, yeah, they're 55 minutes per side. High bias type 2 chrome tape once again. Try to keep the uh, light from reflecting. I'm using a very high budget studio light back there. An honest to goodness over, overhead projector that I picked up off the curb because everybody needs one of those, you know. But anyway, um, there's a seller on the internet known as Easy Street Electronics that has apparently been selling these for the past couple of years. And although supplies tend to ebb and flow, they do still have them. These tapes are still available for purchase. So here's the best part, though. They cost $4 for a 10-pack. But if you order any, beware. I went to order some and have them shipped to me. And rather than choosing the most economical shipping, which would have been UPS ground, although they actually came in a priority mail flat rate box, they had, they had selected UPS Next Day Air, which would have come at a cost of nearly $100. That certainly would have negated any aspect of the bargain that these tapes were. These Radio Shack tapes are not bad tapes. Some people say that they are actually relabeled Maxell tapes from the uh, late 90s, early 2000s. I don't know how true that is. They're not quite as good as the Fujifilm tapes, but the Fujifilm tapes would be a very hard act to follow. One of these Radio Shack tapes had a particularly serious dropout in it about halfway through the uh, tape. It almost sounded like what happens if you have a tape that gets eaten and you manage to extricate it without destroying it. There's always a distorted portion or a missing portion of audio there. And that's what this sounded like, although these tapes have never been used. There's no wear marks on them, no sign of anything. Luckily, the other tapes that I got, I'm willing to chalk that one up to a bad example because the other tapes that I got actually sound pretty good. They don't have the nice bass response, and their noise level is a little higher than the Fujifilm tapes. It's still by no means objectionable, much lower than the average normal bias or Type 1 tape. Just something to be aware of. And it also had a couple of very minor, minor dropouts in it that, again, if you weren't listening critically, you probably wouldn't notice them. Well, I've sat here and babbled on at great length about this whole setup. You're probably bored to death now. So I guess I'll uh, turn the camera off and go edit and upload this video. But thank you for watching, and if you have a comment, do feel free to leave one below. And there, just as a frame of reference so you can hear it, is the noise the Sony deck makes after it's been on for a while. And I'm sure it's just a dry bearing in its little drive motor.